Awesome. Now the room is filling up with our participants. Hey, Mary. Hey, Elizabeth. Colleen, Carol, 925 area code. We see you, <laughs> even though we can't see your picture. Uh, Cam's here. Hi, Cam. I'm so glad you could join us. Beth, Leisha, Sarah, Sarah. Oh, you got a lot of Sarahs. Um, Sandy, Tammy, Tara, Tracy, Trina. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Just waiting for the room to fill up and everybody enter. We just learned that everybody comes in in alphabetical order. Here comes some more. So welcome Deborah and Dolly. We got two Elizabeths at the moment. Amber, Donna. Niner is in the house. Gina. Gerald is here. Hi, Gerald. Thanks for the plug for Wendy in the last session. Uh, I saw it in the Q&A. And we had Henrietta. Oh, hi, Henrietta, all the way from Sweden. Yay. You, uh, Henrietta was a, a moto traveler. She stayed with us uh, several years ago on her southbound uh, uh, trip to through South America. Awesome. Joyce, Judy, Karen, welcome everyone. I think the uh, everybody's in now. So I am super excited to introduce Wendy Crockett. She is not only the 2019 Iron Butt Rally winner, but just an amazing woman. I, I've just fallen in love with her, so <laughs> pardon my girl crush. <laughs> Uh, she's been traveling in Mexico on a long ro uh, road trip with her five-year-old daughter, which I applaud you for because we just got to start them young and get them, get get ladies to be enthusiasts early. And uh, I'm just gonna let you take it over. I'm I'm so excited to hear what you have to say about uh, about long distance riding and yeah. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you for having me. So right up front, I'm sorry everybody, this is a little echoier than I would have liked, but uh, hopefully it's uh, tolerable for you and I can get some good information across. So uh, again, my name is Wendy Crockett. I do a long distance endurance riding is um, really my big thing, but I've also um, done a substantial amount of traveling, close to a million miles um, on two wheels now, most of it solo. I uh, own a motorcycle shop, and I have been a um, factory trained uh, technician for a little over 20 years. So um, that is where I am coming from. Um, and I, I really like to um, uh, kind of leave it open. I really want to encourage you guys to ask questions because you know this is a short time and I can talk all day long about endurance writing stuff. So I want to make sure that you guys are getting your questions answered. So please feel free to just, you know, jump in um, anytime with your, your questions. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we hit, we hit all the bases for, for everybody that's in the audience today. So thanks again for, um, for coming out. So um, I'm going to start with kind of the basics I've done. Um, the Iron Butt Rally, for those of you that aren't aware, um, is an endurance competition. Um, the tagline is 11 days, 11,000 miles, but basically it is a North American wide scavenger hunt and um, everybody plans their own ride. Everybody sets their own goals, whether your goal is to win or, uh, you know, finish well or just finish. Um, so you, we have people that, um, finished with mileages, you know, as low as say 8,500 miles in 11 days, all the way up to um, the highest ever, I think was approaching 14,000. Um, that was a year that, that was real interstate heavy. This was um, a real back road heavy kind of year, but I still did. I did 12,999 miles and I knew I was gonna be that close, but I was so ready to be done. I thought I'm, I would love to do a, a lap around the block and round it out to an even 13,000 miles. And I just, I was ready to be at that hotel and I wish I had done it, but uh, there we are 12,999 miles in 11 days. Um, so there's a couple of, I think we'll probably hit some of the, um, some of the, the uh, big myths around 
um, endurance riding. One is, yes, you can on whatever bike that you have right now. You know, I, I, a lot of people have the impression that you need something specific. You need a sport touring bike. You need a big displacement bike. You need all sorts of sparkles and gadgets and toys and technology. You don't. I mean, especially if you are really just thinking about getting out there for your first saddle sore or really, you know, just kind of expanding your miles out there. You do not need anything special to do that. If you are on a bike um, that you're comfortable on and you enjoy being on, go for it. Um, we've had people do iron butt rallies, uh, you know, the 11 days, 11,000 miles on Ninja 250s and um, like a 1972 water buffalo. And I see mention of Kathy Davies. She is amazing. She is, I mean, she, she probably is half my size, half my height, half my weight, and uh, did it on the Goldwing. And just incredible lady. But yeah, you know, Kurt Warden has done several on the Ninja 250 and then, uh, you know, upgraded to the, the Versus this year. If you enjoy riding it, go out and do it. I tell you what, uh, you know, Kurt has his bike tuned. So I have, um, I ride a 2005 Yamaha FJR. I have about um, closing in on 300,000 miles on that bike right now. And I run auxiliary fuel on it. It's not necessary. I did my first iron butt rally. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned I've done um, five iron butt rallies. Um, my first one I did with no auxiliary fuel on that same bike. Um, but Kurt actually gets better um, fuel economy out of his Ninja 250 with only stock fuel than I get out of my FJR um, with an ox tank. So seriously, get on your bike and go. Um, but uh, the other, I think, major, major misconception is speed, that we're all out there just, uh, you know, hair on fire all the time. And that's not the case for a number of reasons. I mean, when you, you think about, um, uh, one, just, you know, the loss of fuel efficiency, um, when you're running at that, that high of a speed, um, it's just not really worth the trade-off. Um, the, uh, um, sorry, I got distracted. I saw the, <laughs> the other question about preparing for the, uh, IBR, but you know, in order to do a thousand miles in, in 24 hours, um, you're talking about less than 15 hours moving at highway speed. So if you know you're on the interstate doing your ride, keeping an average of 70 miles an hour, that's under 15 hours of riding. So that's a lot of time. You have 10 hours in there to gas up and have traffic jams and stop for a nap and um, stop for food. So it really is not, um, there's nothing about this that necessitates dangerous speeds or, um, you know, riding when you're tired, riding in, you know, unsafe conditions. Uh, it's really more about um, being efficient, being efficient when you are on the bike, but more so being maximally efficient when you are off the bike. Um, so knowing how to handle your gas stops and um, how to handle your food and things like that so that the time um, that you are spending not moving is limited as much as possible. Um, and that was really one of the first I um, rode in rally. My, my first rally ever was the 2009 Iron Butt Rally. I'd never ridden in another rally, but I thought I could do it. And I, you know, why not aim big, right? So I, um, I tossed my head in there and I finished pretty well. I finished 26th um, and then started doing smaller rallies. And um, one of my, um, one of the next rallies that I did was a um, thousand mile, 24 hour Cal 24 rally. And I tell you what, there was nothing went right. Nothing went smoothly. I was screwing everything up. I was having trouble handling my waypoints. So I didn't get out of the start in time and I wrong directions everywhere. And it was just, I just felt like I was failing on every level. And I ended up coming in sixth place out of 
you know, 65 riders or whatever. And um, one of my guys who's now a very good friend said, you just keep the wheels rolling. And that's the difference that uh, things will go right, things will go wrong, things will not go according to plan and you'll have to change your plan. Um, but as long as you're keeping your wheels moving, you are making progress towards that goal. And that's the key is, you know, when I'm, when I'm ready, I've got everything that I need to stay on the bike and minimize my stops and handle because f for all the drama that I'm handling on a ride, you know, other riders are, uh, you know, dealing with the same thing. Other riders have got traffic and misdirections and, um, you know, all the rest of it. So, yeah, you keep your spirits up and, and uh, keep those wheels moving is the best way. And don't, uh, don't be tempted to resort to speed to solve your problems, especially in, I mean, even in um, certified rides, if you're looking to do an actual certified ride, um, it's uh, more and more, you know, if you are submitting a ride that required, um, an unreasonable amount of speed to accomplish it, they're gonna decline your um, your uh, submission. And if you're in an event, there's a lot of things, um, you know, especially on shorter events, like they will have you take your license and registration and they will seal it in an envelope and put a special seal or a sticker on something on there. And if you come back to the starting line and that seal is broken, you're gonna lose a lot of points because that means Somebody's pulled you over and asked to see your uh, license and registration. So there's a lot of, I mean, and then with tracking as well, um, there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of things in place um, to to try to slow people down. It's not about the speed; it's about the puzzle. It's about you know being out there and, and um, working the scavenger hunt. So um, I saw um, Amy asked uh, how I prepare for the IBR. Um, so that's uh, a great question that really leads me into um, kind of like my major um, keystone stuff. My first, um, so my my normal diet is, um, you know, fairly low carb, but just kind of meat and veggies and um, water, not a lot of other stuff. Uh, but my first Iron Butt Rally was like, great, I'm on vacation, right? So, you know, I brought very little food with me and it's all about gas station hot dogs and, you know, having, um, you know, soda and candy and coffee to, you know, to help me get along. And um, that was a terrible idea for a number of reasons. You know, one, whatever your normal diet is, I would recommend if you're going to make a change before something major like the IBR, change it well in advance. So um, I started... It, you know, at, at the beginning of the year, at New Year's, with no sugar, extremely strict diet, no coffee, no alcohol, etc. Um, anticipating having a rally season this year. Turns out we're not, <laughs> we're not looking like we're going to have much of a rally season, but it's always really good to make those changes well in advance so you're not freaking your body out. Um, you know, if your normal diet is gas station hot dogs, and you haven't made this change ahead of time, stick with gas station hot dogs. So you're not going to um, be dealing with the ramifications. I mean, there's, there's a lot of physical ramifications if you're um, making big changes on the fly like that. So um, I would recommend um, kind of sorting out your, your diet uh, a good bit ahead of time if you're gonna be doing a big ride like that. Um, and then I do, I have gotten to the point where um, I bring almost everything that I'm going to consume during those 11 days, I have on the bike with me. And the only exception to that, um, like this uh, 2019 rally, the only food that I ate that did not um, come from stuff that I packed with me was um, food that we ate at the checkpoints. There were um, two official checkpoints um, and they they feed us very well there and you know again sticking with the uh, the protein and the veggies and um then i had uh, uh, uh they we get points for taking rest breaks um and they they'll give you a window and you have to document that you started your rest break within this window to, to claim those points and i was in the middle of nowhere in canada and i desperately needed a place to take my rest break so i bought a uh, um 
like a chicken wrap at a Tim Hortons uh, to to uh, justify my being there in this Tim Hortons in the middle of the night, and then I low key went and took a nap <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the corner of the uh, uh, restaurant. But um, other than that, I carry with me um, good. I like um, Perky Turkey Jerky. It's it's not overly sweet. It's very soft. Um, you know, any any jerky like that, if you get it too gnarly, um, right? Even in the middle of nowhere, you especially have the Tim Hortons. And they were very kind, even though uh, they only spoke French. They seemed to be amused by the, uh, the weird, smelly American sleeping in the restaurant at 2 a.m. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, something like that, you know, some, some good proteins you can get, um, you know, if you're into it, like the tuna pouches. Um, things like that, that's just good lean protein. I carry um, dried, unsweetened, unsulfured fruit, uh, apple rings or um, apricots, things like that. And that kind of serves as my sweet pick-me-up if I um, need to change it up a little bit. Lots of nuts, um, almonds, like unsalted or 50% salt if you can, because otherwise you really start feeling it um, after a few days. Um, you know, macadamias, cashews, that type of thing. And then I like um, some good nut butters. There's some um, Justin's nut butter I like quite a bit because it doesn't have a bunch of preservatives and um, that type of stuff added into it. Um, and that I can eat on the fly. I can open up the little single serve packs um, and eat those really easily on the fly. So um, between all of those things, and then I have, um, I have about a gallon of water. I have two, um, hydration jugs on my bike that I can drink while I'm riding. Um, and uh, between that and then every every so often, um, there's a product I like called Sport Tea. That's a um, uh, like an electrolyte replacement drink, except it's all herbal. There's no sugar, um, anything like that in it. And I can cold brew that in my uh, hydration tank. So when I'm expecting one of those days where it is just gonna be wicked hot, like water is not gonna do the job. Um, pickle juice or sport tea are um, good go-tos. Um, so uh, that's how I keep my diet going. It is super, super important. You know, a lot of people feel like, especially on um, the shorter rides, like you wanna neglect your hydration, right? Because, um, what goes in has to come out, right? So, um, you know, they feel as though um, if they are not taking in too much water, they're going to save themselves some stops. It is not worth it in the long run. Uh, it is super important um, to stay hydrated. And you just, you know, you find that balance uh, between um, if I have to stop, I have to stop. Uh, you know, if it is ridiculously hot outside and I just need to keep taking in fluids, that's what's going to happen. Um, but um, you find a good balance where you you stay hydrated, but, um, you know, aren't having to stop constantly. And um, because, you know, what what starts happening is when you have, when you're not eating a good diet, when you're making sudden big changes to your diet, um, when um, you're neglecting your hydration, um, it becomes really difficult for you to gauge your fatigue. Um, and so that is um, another, you know, really critical thing is um, what happens is as you become overly hot, as you become overly tired, um, you start, you um, losing the ability to gauge how hot or tired you are. Um, so you, you reach this point where, um, you know, you kind of, these signs that you want to be alert for is um, if you are having trouble maintaining your lane position, um, if like you're, you're forgetting to turn your high beams off for oncoming traffic, if you're having trouble maintaining your speed, if you find yourself drifting faster or slower and you're constantly having to correct yourself, um, those are all signs of fatigue. But the big one is that 
you have difficulty making simple decisions. So, you know, you will find, um, God, it just seems like burdensome to decide whether I'm going to get off on this off ramp or the next off ramp to, to get fuel, that type of thing. Um, so once you have reached that point, um, it becomes, it becomes difficult to identify that this is a problem. And um, so you have, um, let's say you're eating a bunch of junk food. You're, you're going from one candy bar to the, you know, to the full sugar sports drink to the, the coffee. And um, uh, so what you end up doing is chasing those sugar rushes. So um, it becomes really easy to miss what is a sugar crash where, you know, you would have energy, you are not necessarily fatigued. Um, and, and what is legitimate fatigue? So um, again, you, you know, you start throwing weird things in for your body to process. You don't take in enough water. You take in the wrong kinds of fluids. Um, and it, it's really working to mask that um, fatigue, which is ultimately your first job should be managing your safety, managing your fatigue on the road. Everything else is, um, you know, a bonus. Everything else, you, you'll live to attempt that right another day. So um, definitely that is what um, made some huge differences for me in terms of um, then identifying, you know, for, for me, I am a morning person. So um, I can ride, say, you know, 20 hours, 22 hours, um, stop. I know that when the sun goes down, say, you know, nine o'clock or whatever, um, my brain starts shutting down. And it's not that I am tired. It's that I've kind of watched the sun go down and my brain's just beep. And so I, I know this about myself, having removed the uh, caffeine and the sugar rushes and everything else. Um, so um, I will plan that into my day, you know, if I need to stop and take a stretch and, you know, just engage a, a gas station clerk in conversation or something for a few minutes. Um, uh, you know, that'll be when I do that. Um, and then I can get going again. And I'm usually good for for a good chunk of time after that but the next time that i start feeling tired that is when i am tired that's when i stop for um you know a good nap um if i can um i will aim to um set my timing so let's say i'm going to bed at two o'clock and i can wake up at six o'clock and i can wake up with the sun and that resets me um, I know a lot of people have the exact opposite problem. They watch the sun come up and it, it makes them want to go to sleep. So, you know, it, what works for me isn't necessarily what um, is going to work for everybody, but the critical thing is removing all the other, um, you know, as many other irritants and disguising factors as possible so you can identify um, in yourself, uh, you know, what's fatigue. And I've seen a few uh, incredulous uh, uh, comments about the um, pickle juice, but yeah, it's, you've got um, the, you know, the sodium in there and the, um, you know, different uh, little minerals, sometimes a little sugar, but um, uh, it, it really does a great job of replenishing you and you can get that as well in um, like little packets similar to like <clears throat> an emergency, something like that. That So you just do that, you toss it in a, um, you know, water bottle, uh, on the trip, it's really easy to carry, um, and it does a good job. So, um, as far as the the tools that I use for uh, routing, uh, Amy was asking. Um, so, I have uh, begrudgingly <laughs> changed from uh, Streets and Trips uh, over to Basecamp because um, Streets and Trips was discontinued a few years ago, and. Um, uh, I like what I like, and I was really confident with it. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I'm getting, I'm good with Basecamp. I'm getting better with it. Um, but you know, I mean, more and more. So I've got, I run two GPSs. I have a, um, a Zumo 665 and a Zumo 595. So a little, little bit older, um, but they're they're getting the job done. But I mean, me as with many other people, 
um, are starting to branch out to other technologies. Phones are getting so good. Um, and I can have, um, I can have Google Maps, which now incorporates traffic information um, that's giving me much better real-time information um, than what I'm getting necessarily even out of, um, uh, you know, the, the Zumos, some of them have the option to do um, like XM traffic and, and weather and whatnot um, and can incorporate that into your routing, but it's not nearly as real-time um, as what people are getting out of their phones. So more and more you're seeing people run in um, little tablets. And um, so I have uh, my primary GPS that will have my whole leg on it um, from this checkpoint to the next checkpoint or this checkpoint to my next major time limited bonus. And I might have um, five or 10 bonuses in there. Um, and my that that doesn't get touched. 2017, cost me a very good finish. I finished seventh, but that's not nearly as good as I would have um, because I broke my rule and I was monkeying around in that and I inadvertently switched the order of two of the critical um, bonuses and that really screwed me up. Um, so I have my, my secondary uh, GPS that I use for the what ifs. Could I add this in? What happens if I take this out? Where's the nearest gas station? Um, that type of stuff. So I, I fool around with all my little what ifs just on my secondary. But what I did more so this year is um, I have my whole leg uh, in my primary GPS and um, I routed point to point using my phone. And um, that was, I mean, especially like on the East Coast when there's so much traffic consideration and it's just so dynamic all the time. Um, that was really helpful. So I think we're going to start seeing a big shift um, to that kind of technology. It's getting better with offline maps and um, that type of thing. So um, we'll see. I, I have been uh, looking at tablets and, you know, weatherproof tablets are getting cheaper and faster. Um, so we'll see. It's, it's an interesting time. That being said, there are still people that um, do a darn good job uh, rallying with paper maps, you know, the shorter rallies, um, 24, you know, 36 hour rally um, with a paper map. Um, yeah, don't let it stop you if you don't have a GPS, um, you know, especially when you got, you got your phone, you've got a great little computer in your pocket. Um, I have, um, Paige was asking how I get to the starting point. Uh, I have only ever um, ridden to the starting point. Um, so like this year from when I left home, um, got across the country to the starting point of the whole rally and then uh, rode home. I did something like 18,000 miles in two and a half weeks. Um, but a lot of guys um, do ship or trailer to the starting line. And the, you know, the, the explanation that I've heard is um, I don't, ride my, I don't, I don't drive my race car to the track. And that does make a lot of sense. You know, you, you get your bike all set up and um, you want it to be hundred percent set up and ready to go when you get there. Nobody, you know, there's not a, nobody's going to give you a hard time about, uh, about either way. Um, it's just uh, my preference to ride. What I find on like the super long rallies I've done, not just the uh, iron bar rallies, but I've done several 10 day, 10,000 mile rallies. Um, and that first night is the hardest for me. It's like getting my body to accept that we're doing this again, and, you know, changing the whole schedule up. So um, I like to ride to the start and I'll do like I did 1600 miles in about 21 hours to get to the starting line this time, um, which was actually really good for me because it was like getting that first day of the rally out uh, ahead of the rally, you know, just kind of getting back into the routine. So um, to each their own, there's, you know, there's no right or wrong answer there. Um, uh, Elizabeth was asking, um, do I listen to music? I do. I, um, uh, I have podcasts and um, I used to do um, XM, but uh, now I just download a, you know, a whole bunch of podcasts and um, I have a lot of uh, music I listen to, but um, this, the theme of the, the rally of this year, um, in 2019 was the road less traveled. So it was 
by its very nature, a lot of very small roads, a lot of technical roads. And um, it was such a fun, engaging rally that I very rarely turned my music on, which is great. I mean, that is a sign of an amazing rally when you're so, um, when you're so engaged. Um, and I, you know, I get along those lines, you get a lot of people that are like, why would you do this? What a waste. Look at all of these places you've been by and you never get to enjoy them. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a better way to think of it is you've got two weeks for vacation. Think about that place, you know, by home, like your favorite little spot, your hole in the wall, your best road, your best restaurant. And then imagine you have an entire massive community of people with all of their favorite best spots and those all get thrown together, um, you know, into this bonus pack where, you know, you can choose to go for points. You can go to choose to visit interesting places. Um, and uh, it's like you are showing up and having somebody else plan 90% of an epic motorcycle vacation for you. And it's just up to you to kind of, you know, fine tune that last bit. Um, but I have seen so much incredible stuff, so many amazing things that I never would have seen. Lots of stuff I've gone back to visit, plenty of stuff where in order to get the points, you're walking through the museum, you're taking a tour, you're taking a sky tram ride, you're shooting a squad assault weapon. I mean, you know, all these oddball things like, you know, it's not stuff that we would necessarily know about or seek out um, in our free time, but um, have had such a wonderful time. So yeah, we and I, you have those events that are so actively entertaining that I rarely turn on my music. When I do, um, I have a, um, a playlist put together that is, the most wildly divergent collection of music. And um, I've had many people that are like, yeah, sure. And then I turn it on and they're like, I think my head's gonna explode. You have to make it stop. I can't go from, from Pantera to Patsy Cline. It does not compute. But um, you know, I have selected specifically just all stuff that I can dance on the bike to, all stuff that I can sing along to. When I turn my music on, it's because I wanna you know, stay engaged, give my brain something to do. So you know, I really like my selection of weird, crazy music to uh, you know, keep me going on those long stretches of interstate. Um, so the uh, um, sleeping, I, um, I normally am a very light sleeper. Uh, Roberta was asking, you know, how do I manage sleep? Um, so I have always, I have found that I do better um, even if I'm only going to get a handful of hours of sleep, especially if I'm only gonna get a couple of hours of sleep. Um, I do better in a hotel because then I am not, you know, you don't have bugs crawling on you and you're not always listening for footsteps nearby. Um, uh, and that type of thing. Um, one thing that I would say is um, uh, something that I learned early on is not to make hotel reservations. And you know, it's kind of um, one of those things. That some some events, the Iron Butt Rally, you don't get your um, um, reservation. You, you don't get your bonus locations necessarily far enough in advance that you really be making. Um, hotel reservations, other rallies are different that you can get them far in advance and kind of um, gauge out your stops. And what I found is um, when I have a hotel reservation somewhere, I will push myself to that hotel reservation. And so I don't want to be pushing myself to that hotel reservation. I want to be listening for signs of fatigue. And when I am fatigued, I want to stop just right now. I don't want to have the conversation with myself when I am reaching that point of being too tired to make intelligent decisions, um, well, it's only a hundred miles. I'm just going to push a hundred miles because I have uh, a hotel reservation down the road. I, I don't do that. Um, when I, when I am ready to stop, I'm ready to stop. And if I can't find a, um, you know, hotel when I'm ready to stop, I absolutely do iron butt motel it, sleeping on the bike next to the bike, um, that type of thing. Um, I sleep um, fully geared up. If it's cool, you know, I have my heated vest, I'll sleep right next to the bike and, and have my vest plugged in. Um, and that is twofold. One, it's, you know, it kind of keeps me safe and my helmet is my pillow. Um, but it also kind of um, 
I don't think I'm really immediately identifiable as a woman sleeping on the ground when I am fully geared up next to the bike. And I've never been, I've never had anybody hassle me. Um, a couple other tricks that uh, guys use, movie theaters. Um, if it is hot, um, you know, especially, you know, you're going, um, going across Phoenix in the middle of the summertime or whatever, and you just need to ride out that hot period of time, go buy a ticket to a cheap movie and go sleep in the theater because it's air conditioned and it's quiet and it's dark. Um, so that's a good one. Um, uh, something else a lot of guys do, um, late night diner or a truck stop, something like that. Order your food, give the, uh, you know, white person a generous tip. Say, I'm going to set my alarm for 20 minutes or two hours. Please have my food ready in two hours. Um, and I, I very, very rarely have heard about guys having any trouble with that. You know, most of the time, especially, you know, you're doing a 24 hour diner in the middle of the night. They're super cool about it. Um, you know, the, the handful of times that I've done it, just, it's, it's really kind of this novelty, this, you know, weird person sleeping, you know, in their gear in the corner. Generally, it's, it's funny how much being on a rally emboldens you. I mean, like, I don't think any of us would, uh, you know, be like, uh, you know, I'm going to go buy a movie ticket and take a bath um, <laughs> in real life or, uh, you know, go in just to take a nap. Um, but we become so emboldened somehow in the course of a rally that it's, it's really fun what, um, what you find, what you experience, what you get from other people. I mean, there's so much, uh, you know, so many cool people in this world that you, you interact with um, when you kind of uh, take down that uh, <laughs> veneer of normal life. So um, those are a couple of, of cool um, you know, ways to handle if you just need a nap um, when you're uh, on the road. But um, I do um, also, let's see, oh, about uh, um, the safety aspect. Um, it's, uh, uh, let me ask um, Shaw Marie's, um, can I talk more about the safety aspect um, as riders, you know, are we mentally processing um, all the what ifs, how do you stay present 100% of the time. And that's where, um, you know, you, I, I try to walk the line between, um, you know, with the podcasts and the music and things like that. Um, I don't ever want it to lull me. I don't, I, you know, I, if I have my music on, I want to be actively engaged with that. Um, it's doing a job um, at that point. I don't ever want it to become background noise. There's a, we have enough din in our daily lives. I ride to get rid of the din. I ride so that just all this crap in the world just fades away and I have this moment that it is the here and now um, that I'm focusing on. So I, I, I try to keep from reintroducing um, din, but if I need something um, to keep my mind engaged, absolutely, that's when I will, um, uh, that's when I, I'll employ those tricks. Um, I like doing math games, running through um, the, if I, you know, if I'm adding in this bonus, if I'm taking out this bonus, um, uh, am I five eighths of the way through my ride? If I go another hundred kilometers, how far will that get me? What is kilometers converted into miles? Just, you know, these nonsense um, uh, exercises that you put your brain through um, uh, to really, uh, you know, kind of keep present to make sure that you're um, you're aware. I really make a point of um, doing all my scans, um, you know, making sure that I'm regularly checking my mirrors, checking my blind spots, seeing who's around me. Um, something else that I like to do is um, like big um, muscle um, kind of workouts on the bike, you know, off the bike at gas stations, uh, that type of thing. It's easy to um, stretch over the seat and, you know, that type of thing while you're gassing up. But um, uh, I like to use the wind to, you know, kind of stretch my arms, uh, you know, twist around, stretch my back, stick my legs out and kind of do um, reps. Um, and that gets, that gets your blood flowing, um, that kind of gets your, um, uh, keeps, things, keeps things moving. Um, and that really helps to, um, you know, if you find you just, 
slogging down interstate and hopefully you know you know especially if you're doing shorter rides if you're doing certified rides set it up so you're not slogging down interstates set it up so that you're not um you know riding into the sun and kind of having these other um irritants and distractions and you know whatnot going on but you know sometimes you end up in that position where you've got a lot of um a lot of interstate not a, you got a lot of florida to get through <laughs> So um, doing that, just doing big motions and, um, uh, you know, keeping, keeping the blood moving, counting through those reps. Now I'm doing 10 reps on this side and then I'm doing 10 reps on this side. And it just, it, it helps pass the time and keep you engaged um, with what's going on as long as you're just not doing that um, to the exclusion of um, paying attention to what's going on around you. Um, and that really helps. Um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, keeping your, it, it, it's very easy in the course of 11 days to have things start to atrophy. Um, so it's, um, it's good as well. A lot of, uh, riders do kind of modified yoga, um, type stuff on the bike. Just, you know, you want to, um, you want to keep active. You want to make sure that, uh, what you are putting in your body and what you are asking of your body, um, keeps you going. Uh, so that's very helpful. Um, yeah, and there's uh, Judy had uh, pointed out with the um, you know keeps your keeps your blood uh, from clotting on your feet, keeps your legs from swelling, just like being on an airplane. You know, on an airplane you can get up and and um, walk around once in a while. We don't quite have, and you know, and again, I mean, just depending on the event, like this year's Iron Butt Rally, there's a ton of hiking. I did. I can't even guess, maybe 20 miles or more of hiking. There was um, there were hikes that you get to the waypoint that they provided, and it's a five mile hike down the trail to actually score your points. So that was very, very cool too, because that um, kept your body and your mind engaged in, um, in a very different way rather than uh, um, just sitting around. But um, yeah, Shaw Marie, you know, a lot of people say, you know, she, she says she has trouble with um, zoning out uh, when there's um, music and a lot of people are definitely um, the same way. I know a lot of the international riders um, on the Iron Butt Rally, on these bigger uh, rallies, um, never have any sort of distraction because they are so busy um, with all of those other kind of little things that we take for granted. You know, once you, you're a bit of a more experienced rider um, in general, um, think about some of the things that fell away from your active consciousness um, that you were super aware of when you were uh, an earlier writer. And um, a lot of the international guys are kind of almost in that early writer mindset where they're so busy processing how different US, there's no room in their brain for music or podcasts or anything else. They don't need any more, you know, they don't, they don't need diversion or uh, distraction because uh, you know, they're, making sure they're staying on the correct side of the road and processing how the road rules work. So, um, you know, it's definitely uh, different for everybody. And then it changes over the course of our riding careers too, you know, as you're, um, you know, on uh, comfortable with your bike and comfortable with the miles and, and that type of thing, um, you know, what you enjoy um, is definitely going to change. Um, so, um, let's see, Margie, I plugged my first tire two weeks ago. It was on the touring bike. And although I used a gummy worm plug, I was uncomfortable with it on the touring bike, um, holding up fairly well. Um, I've run through, so I'm a mechanic for a living. Um, I've run through a lot of different types of, um, plugs. I will tell you that I carry darn near everything with me on the bike. If I can conceivably change it on the side of the road and save my rally, and that includes a stator, I carry a stator with me because I did have to change it on a rally one time. Um, so if I could do it, um, I come prepared for it. Um, the I don't like the mushroom style plugs. Uh, what I found is those are most helpful for punctures. They are not helpful with slices. And then if you start having like a little bit of um, leaking, or if you're not able to, um, you know, some of the smaller um, tire pumps that you carry with you on the bike aren't able to inflate a tire up quite up to um, what spec would be on some of the heavier touring bikes, especially if they're, you know, calling for 42 pounds of pressure or whatever, and that your pump maybe only goes up to 35. Um, those mushroom plugs can fall out, and then that leaves you in a worse situation. 
What I would recommend, Margie, um, uh, is uh, if you want to keep that tire, if you have a lot of tread left, that puncture is not in the sidewall, get a quill plug. Um, you can either, you know, buy one at the auto parts store, bring it to a shop, ask for a quill plug. And what that is, is um, it's a flat patch with a plug in the center. It's installed from the um, inside, so the, the tire has to come off. But that's considered a permanent repair on that. So between the patch and the plug, um, that is um, a permanent repair. You don't have, like on the gummy worms, which is what I use, um, those are great. You know, I went up to, I rode up to a Nuvik, which is like riding on 700 miles of broken beer bottles. <laughs> so it's fine as long as all the beer bottles are laying flat. But um, when you catch them on their side, you're getting big slices. Um, and those gummy worms are great because you can cram three or four of those in there and solve your problems. Um, it's not a permanent fix though. And I, you know, ideally your um, top speed is limited to 55 miles an hour until you either get a new tire or get a full plug in there. Um, and that'll help. But I've done it, you know, I've done, I had a blowout, like a severe blowout, and that's a whole nother long story. In the middle of Saskatchewan on my first Iron Butt Rally. Um, that was a ton of fun. But um, other than that one, I I probably plugged two or three tires um, on Iron Butt Rallies with sticky worms, um, and they've got me where I've needed to go. So uh, I've never DNF'd an Iron Butt Rally, and I, you know, knock on wood, um, haven't had a tire keep me out yet. So yeah, um, custom seats. I use a Russell Daylong hands down. If I had to pick one thing to pick, you know, to retain on my rally bike, 100%, it would be my Russell Daylong seat. Um, and don't, um, you know, I'm not talking custom. I'm not talking like Corbin. I mean, like uh, Russell Daylong, um, uh, the Mayer brothers, uh, there's um, Rocky Mayer. Um, full on custom to your butt. So I, I shattered my pelvis in a motorcycle accident and I sit kind of wonky side saddle. Um, I did a ride in appointment um, with Russell Daylong and they actually, um, my seat is wonky sideways um, to compensate for how I sit. And um, that is absolutely a hundred percent. In fact, uh, you know, that Rally season is uh, a giant question mark. I just sent my seat into after um, I've got about 275,000 miles, uh, butt miles on my Russell Daylong. I just sent it in um, to be recovered on my 300,000 mile bike, 100%. I'm gonna keep that seat in the top notch shape because that is, that is um, absolutely worth the investment. So that's what um, uh, I would recommend there. Uh, Paige was asking about, um, seats and um, on, you know, there's a lot of other, uh, bead rider is a really good one. People constantly, I have an FC one um, that I also do big miles on and um, I have a bead rider on that. People are always making comments about how it's like, a, um, a, like a taxi cab seat, right? But it's super nice. Like it, you can shift around, it keeps the air flowing. That's really important is that we keep dry, like, you know, the hygiene on the longer, um, trips, it's, it's super important that you not get swamped, but, um, doing, um, like monkey butt powder and that type of stuff is not good, especially on the long term because you're wet and then you're adding powders to that and it creates this paste, um, you know, get some good base layers, get a good seat. It makes all the difference in the world. Um, I ride with, um, LD comfort base layers, no powders, um, and, uh, my seat and I am good. I finished the iron butt rally. Had a good night's sleep, got on the bike the next day, rode all the way, you know, a few thousand miles home, a circuitous route, and I was super sad to be home. Like, I did not, at no point was I like, I'm in so much pain that I just want this to end, you know what I mean? Um, so let me, quick, I know we're running short on time. I could talk about this all day long. Um, uh, let's see, um, shoulders tense up, that's a big one. Um, Shannon's asking about shoulders tensing up. Um, oh. Are we running out of time? We are, answer your last question and then real quick and then we need to wrap it up. Thank you. Yep. So. I am, I'm lucky enough that I have a fuel cell that I'm able to do good twists, but that's the big one. You know, try to, um, you know, be, be aware. We, we kind of tend to sit with our hands on the bars and you kind of zone out or tense up. Um, and uh, that, that's really gonna make that problem worse quickly. But do those side to side stretches, you know, reach across to yourself, um, you know, do that type of thing. I have 
I don't um, cruise control. I don't need one. I don't like one. I don't use it a lot, but I do have a go cruise. Um, so I just set that, um, you know, just the throttle lock for when I need to do those stretches um, to keep that tension out from between my shoulders. So, yep, that's a tough one for everybody for sure. So thank you guys so much for, uh, for showing up and hopefully we'll see you tonight in roll call and we can uh, maybe answer some other questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Wendy. And uh, can you all see why I have a girl crush on her? She's amazing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the good news is, if you haven't gotten enough of Wendy, like I haven't, Wendy is actually going to be, uh, can I say this? Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wendy's actually going to be staff on our Suffragist Centennial motorcycle ride um, this year, this August, providing we can all gather and and ride motorcycles across the country uh, uh july 31st to august 23rd we're gonna have a nationwide ride celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote in the united states and uh it's a suffragist centennial motorcycle ride and wendy's going to be with us coast to coast so you can hopefully we can meet a lot of you guys out there it's going to be a lot of fun i'm super excited keeping my fingers crossed that the world returns to normal yes Yes, that's, we all need to set the intention. And as a matter of fact, uh, I hope everybody does show up for roll call tonight if you feel like networking because uh, we've got a big announcement in the, in the gathering. So um, yay, thanks for tuning in. And next up is Trisha, Sol oh, I always, Trisha Zalewski. <laughs> um, she is the editor of Women Writers Now, and she's going to talk to us about empowering your motor self, how to become a self-sufficient motorcyclist. So we'll see you in a few minutes, take a break, get a drink of water, come back for another exciting presentation. Thank you so much. See you everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. <laughs>